What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Whether you're joining us on YouTube and you're looking at my ugly mug, or you're listening via the podcast to my beautiful voice. Welcome back. It's your boy Nicholas, Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. Today, we're going to be talking about the best quarterbacks to pick late. If you're a late quarterback streamer, you're someone who picks quarterbacks late, I'm going to break down the best quarterbacks to pick based on their early season schedule. Because I think a lot of people make the mistake of picking a lot of guys based on their ADP and that's it. And they don't look at like the first two, three weeks of the season. And then you're like, shit, I need to get another quarterback now. So if you're a streamer, the thing to do is pick quarterbacks that you're going to be dropping anyways for six weeks down the line that have really easy early season schedules. Now, the reason I don't really break down my analysis into like strength of schedule, I usually don't make videos like that because I think it's ridiculous past week four or five, maybe like six is probably the point where I would stop looking at analysis. Past that, you have no idea how good a defense is gonna be. You have no idea about injuries. Like going into the season, you can make predictions. I think the best thing to do is look at this team is really good against pass, uh, the pass, like they're a really strong pass defense. You can only really say that if they're in like the top five or seven, right? Because if you're in the top five or the bottom five, that means that your personnel was probably very good. And it's very hard to fall off or gain ground if you're all the way at the bottom, just year over year. Yeah, you could make the change over a couple years, but for the most part, if you're a bottom five pass defense, you're not going to flip things to be a top five pass defense the, the, the next year, right? You need a lot of personnel change and a lot of things to happen in that time. So, so I would say for you guys that if you do draft based on strength of schedule, keep the analysis to, to a small sample size. It should be nothing more than probably like a tiebreaker at best. Now let's get into the first quarterback. Mitchell Trubisky of the Chicago Bears being picked at quarterback 23, overall 153. Apart from being everyone and their mother's favorite sophomore breakout quarterback this year, Trubisky benefits from a very, very, very Sunday morning easy schedule. Assuming you don't drink tequila like myself on Saturday nights. You take a look at this schedule. They start with a divisional matchup with Green Bay. Green Bay was arguably the worst passing defense in the NFL last year. And I know they're going to be much improved given their two early cornerback picks in, in Alexander and Josh Jackson in the draft, right? Too. Uh, I'd be ecstatic if I was a Packers fan. But again, it goes back to the point that if you're the 30th ranked team in the NFL in terms of passing, it's more than just getting a couple cornerbacks. Like you're still... At best, they're going to be an average pass defense. They're not going to become elite because they pick two rookie cornerbacks. So I think that's an easy matchup to kind of start things off with for Trubisky, right? This isn't Madden where you just plug players in and everything becomes perfect. It's going to take some time for this defense to start gelling. After that, they move on to Seattle, who basically lost 90% of their defense. While they had a, a good ranking last year, right? Seventh in terms of yards per attempt. And that's what this is, yards per attempt, which is a, a good telling number. Don't look at total yards per game when you're going on like rush defense or pass defense. It's a terrible statistic to look at. But Seattle lost everybody. Body, right, they Richard Sherman, Jeremy Lane, Deshaun Sheed, Michael Bennett. We don't know what's going on with Earl Thomas. He might get traded. It's a mess there, and it's likely that a lot of fantasy quarterbacks are going to be able to take advantage of that in 2018. Arizona's uh, pass defense is, is low key, still pretty tough. But after that, he gets a beautiful bye week sandwich. Tampa Bay and Miami, two of the worst pass defenses in the NFL last year. Apart from the early season schedule, Trubisky is a guy, like I said, is on top of a lot of people's breakout lists, and that's because of the offensive changes that they made. Most importantly, bringing in Matt Nagy as their as their coach. Got rid of John Fox and that terrible, terrible offense. And statistic that I heard the other day, I forget what podcast it was on, but they were talking about neutral game scripts. So last year they looked at play calls where teams were either trailing or winning by like six points or less. So the game was still in reach very much. That's what they call a neutral game script. And they were saying the Bears were one of like the top three most head run heavy teams in neutral game scripts, while the Chiefs were the top five uh, pass heavy teams in neutral game scripts. So you can expect a lot more passing out of the Chiefs. I don't think, I mean, the Bears with Matt Nagy coming over from the Chiefs. I don't think I needed to kind of say that to you, but apart from the coaching staff, which I think is going to be the most instrumental part of the change in this offense, they bring in Allen Robinson, they bring in Taylor Gabriel, they bring in Trey Burton, they bring in Anthony Miller. So this offensive core is completely revamped. And when you bring in weapons like that, it's very hard to fail. So we're going to find out really quickly whether or not Trubisky is what we think he's going to be. And you look at Nagy again, brings a new, more explosive type of offense to Chicago, where we saw him take 
over play calling duties from Andy Reid in Kansas City down the stretch last year. He led them to a four and one record while having the play calling duties there, averaging over 28 points per game in that span. The Chiefs starting quarterback averaged over 291 passing yards per game and over 34 passing attempts per game in that span. And we know how Trubisky was barely utilized last year in the passing game. He had games where he was throwing the ball like 12 times. So that's a huge upgrade just in terms of volume, of course. It's gonna be a lot of fun, right? Trubisky is a guy with a really big arm, rushing ability up and could pay dividends immediately out of the game because of this schedule. So he's a guy that could take advantage of this really early season schedule all the way up to week six. Then we move on to quarterback number two, Case Keenum, Denver Broncos. He's going right behind uh, Mitchell Trubisky. So Trubisky was overall 153. Case Keenum is 155, quarterback 24. He has this tremendous, tremendous 2017 season, season, season with the Vikings. Steps in for the injured Sam Bradford, plays phenomenally. And then I think he's just immediately written off as like a fluke. And then he signs with Denver as for two years, $36 million. We look at the situation he winds up in. The weapons in Denver are worth Worse than they were in Minnesota for Keenum, but I don't think it's a major, major, major fall off, right? Thielen and Diggs going to Demarius Thomas and Emmanuel Sanders are a fall off, but it's not like he's going to a situation where he doesn't have weapons. Like Emmanuel Sanders and D Thomas are proven weapons that at the worst are above average wide receivers. So I think he's still working with plenty, plenty good weapons. Not a major fall off here. Plus you add Portland Sutton, you add Deshaun Hamilton, you have Carlos Henderson returning. So he's got weapons that are unproven, but definitely upside in this offense. While I don't think Denver is like a high flying explosive offense by any means, Keenum was able to finish as quarterback 15 last year playing for the Vikings on a team that ran the ball more than any other team in the NFL, not named the Jacksonville Jaguars. They ran the ball 31.3 times per game. Then you look at Denver and despite having an absolute shit show at quarterback, were the 11th highest NFL team in terms of pass attempts per game with 35.4. A team that had absolutely nobody at quarterback was 11th most pass friendly team in the NFL. And then you had Minnesota where Case Keenan was quarterback 15 in fantasy where they were running the ball so many times per game. So I think even if you think his efficiency drops off, he's gonna have a lot more volume there. Now, if we put Keenum at those numbers in terms of pass attempts, right? Pass attempts moving over from Minnesota to Denver. If you take that 35.4 pass attempts per game, I wanted to average that out and see what that looked like over a 16 game span. We take the stats of last year with the pass attempts of what Denver Broncos quarterbacks had last year. He's looking at an increase of 370 passing yards and two or three more passing touchdowns. And that's just in 15 games because that's how many games Keenum played in last year. If he plays the, the full 16 games, we're looking at a top 12 quarterback finish, if not a top 10 option, like for sure. And I just also want to throw this out there because uh, it's a neat little article from Matt Harmon over to NFL.com who works with the Next Gen Stats, which I will link down below. It's a pretty neat thing that the NFL.com is working uh, working on. They put little chips in players' shoulders or helmets or something somewhere on their uniform and they stat, they track like speed and the separation and things like that. So it's pretty cool. And you look at these stats. Keenum was the NFL's third best tight window thrower last year. Ranked really, really well in uh, completion percentage, passer rating, and adjusted yards per attempt for tight window thrower. But let's look at his schedule. Pretty nice schedule to start out. Outside of Baltimore, these are cake matchups. I already talked about Seattle while they did, they played well last year. Or their overall rank last year was good. They lost basically their entire defense. Oakland is a horrible passing defense. Baltimore, week three, you're absolutely gonna wanna stay away from there. But Kansas City, New York Jets, average, if not below average, uh, both of those both of those teams. So Case Keenum, absolutely a late round quarterback streamer that you could start right away and plug right into your lineup. Apart from Baltimore, every one of those defenses is one that you can uh, can definitely exploit. And Kansas City was, was okay, but they lost Marcus Peters. The Jets definitely overperformed. They started off pretty strong, but again, they're average on that side of the ball. So Keenum is very, very, very under the radar. And he's a guy who, again, is not going to be a flashy guy, but Keenum was a prolific quarterback in college. So when given the chance throughout his career, he's shown that he could be a, a really good passer, a really good pure quarterback. He smashed records at University of Houston. I think he threw for over 5,000 yards multiple times, two, if not three, I could be wrong on that. But I think anytime he's been given a reasonable shot, he's been able to succeed there. So don't be surprised if Keenum exceeds expectations in 2018, especially in the early portion of the year with that schedule. That's two of three guys. And I want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for the video. Fantasyjocks.com. Where's the belt at? Where'd the belt at? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Hey. What's up, dude? 
So, fantasyjocks.com, I will link them in the description. Of course, they're sponsoring the video. They are the number one leader in the industry, fantasy sports equipment for your league. I'm talking about championship belts. I'm talking about rings. They have awesome trophies too. I gotta get them to send me one so I can actually show you what they look like. They're like Lombardi trophies. You can get everything engraved. You can get the winner's team's names engraved on there. You can get them on the trophies as well. They have plaques that you can put on. Give your uh, your league winner a ring each year so you know it's legit. It's really not that big of a deal. Have everyone chip in an extra $5, $10, $12, depending on how many people are in your league. Grab yourself one of these bad boys. It makes playing so much more fun knowing that something like this is on the line. I promise you that it's going to be well worth the money. If you look at the reviews on their website, just check out the bell. It's like tons and tons and tons of five-star reviews. People are like, oh, it looked a little expensive, but when we got it, totally worth it. I'm telling you, high quality, leather, gold. This is 24 karat gold, my friends. It's not really 24 karat gold, but it is awesome. I promise you that. And see, I'm gonna chuck it over there. It's gonna be fine. It might've actually just broke my couch. That's how durable that thing is. So check out fantasyjocks.com. Thank you for sponsoring the video. I also wanna plug my draft guide. I'm gonna put this little video teaser in here. Grab it now on my website for July 1st, and you're gonna get it at a discount, pre-order price. July 1st, the price goes up, but it's gonna be dope, completely interactive, completely online. Get it on your phone, computer, tablet, whatever it is, updated, weekly updated throughout the entire summer, so it's not stagnant. The rankings are always gonna be updated. Really, really, really cool stuff. Exclusive stuff you're not gonna get on my YouTube channel. So bigdogsfantasy.com, also linked in the description. All right, so my number three, late round streamer, I say that with quotations, is Matt Stafford of the Lions. Now he's getting picked at 102 overall, quarterback 11. Now obviously he's not necessarily a late round sleeper, but outside of the top 10 quarterbacks, outside of pick 100, I want to throw him in here because he's my favorite quarterback in terms of value, in terms of just a starting fantasy quarterback outside of those like top tier guys, right? Outside of the Aaron Rodgers is the Tom Brady's, the Cam Newton's and the Sean Watson's and those guys, Matt Stafford, I, I think is the best value because you're getting a guy who is coming off arguably the best year of his career, like 4,400 passing yards, I think, I don't know, 26, 28 touchdowns, something like that. Looked really, 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 really good last year. And you know what you're getting out of Stafford, right? You're getting a guy with a really high floor and you're getting this for two reasons. You're getting it first in terms of his ability. Like I said, he played really well last year, but secondly, because of the volume that he gets year in and year out. Matt Stafford has consistently ranked every season since 2011 in the top seven in terms of pass attempts per season. So that volume base is there every single year. Last year, he had the fourth most attempts overall in the NFL for any quarterback. They have Jim Bob Cooter coming back, still calling the plays, so I don't expect that offense to shift dramatically. And they do bring in a couple running backs, but I don't think, I think that just makes their running game and their offense overall more effective. I don't think they're gonna be like, oh, LeGarrette Blunt's here, carry on Johnson's here, let's shift 100 pass attempts over to the running game. I don't think that's how it's gonna work. What else Matt Stafford has going for him is their offensive line has finally started to improve. And improve? pretty well. Something Stafford had not had the luxury of kind of experiencing in a long time in Detroit, right? They were like the laughing stock of the league, that, that Detroit offensive line for a long time. So they were already improving. And then they decided to use their first round pick on Frank Ragnar out of Arkansas, the my top rated center in the, uh, in the draft. Now Ragnar is a guy who allowed zero career sacks at the college level. Playing in the uh, SEC allowed zero career sacks. You could say he's pretty good. They also grabbed the kid in Terrell Crosby in the uh, fifth round. People expect to go within the first round, if not the first two rounds, dropped in the draft because of concussion issues. So there's a lot of upside there in their draft picks. 
We'll have to see if health becomes an issue or anything like that. But a really solid group of offensive linemen that's improving. And then you look at the weapons, man. He still has Golden Tate. He has Marvin Jones, who looked like a really, really, really good passing option for him last year. You bring in the running backs, and I think that makes the uh, the offense as a whole just more efficient. Kenny Galladay coming into his second year, I think, is going to be an absolute key piece of this offense. I'm really excited. I think Stafford is an incredible value just because his floor is so high. Uh, he finished last year as quarterback eight. Again, I want to look at Matt Harmon's NFL next-gen stats, and he was labeled or ranked as the second best tight window passer last year in the NFL. Completion percentage fourth, passer rating second, adjusted yards per attempt first. And according to Harmon, he was the only quarterback to clear 7.0 adjusted yards per attempt last year. The only quarterback in the NFL and is the only player to rank inside the top five in tight window completion percentage in each of the last two seasons. So he's kind of in a league of his own there. So he's being underrated as a quarterback in terms of how good he is um, overall. Great weapons, improved offensive line, should keep Stafford in the weekly top 10 discussion uh, regardless of matchups. He has not finished with less than 4,240 passing yards since 2010 and has actually increased that number in four consecutive seasons, people. He's averaging 28 passing passing touchdowns over the last three seasons. Last year, only three quarterbacks not named Matt Stafford threw for more than 28 passing touchdowns. And then since this video is all about early season schedule, let's take a look. New York Jets starts off at home. That's a nice matchup. At San Francisco, another nice matchup. They should be improved, but it's gonna take time for them to get really, really improved. So even adding Richard Sherman doesn't make them an all-star caliber lineup on defense. New England, while they had their ups and downs last year, they got better as the season progressed. They still were not great on the passing front. You got at Dallas, Green Bay, Miami. So nothing that scares you away here at all for Stafford. And Stafford's not a guy who like, Trubisky, where you might back up off a tough matchup, Stafford's a proven guy. So even if you have like an, an average matchup or an above average matchup, you're not scared about starting Stafford. Nothing really scares you over, over the course of the entire first half of the season. And to be honest, I was looking at the rest of the season, nothing uh, nothing scares me whatsoever when it comes to Stafford. They do play Minnesota twice, of course, because they're in the division and they get the Rams, but overall it's, it's a very generous schedule for my boy Matty Stafford here. So he's my third one. And that wraps up the three guys. And I wanna talk about some other notes, uh, some other, well, actually just one quarterback in particular that I kind of zoned in on in the beginning of this video. But first I want, if you found this video helpful, please drop a thumbs up down below. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. If you're listening to me via podcast, please leave the uh, podcast a rating and review because that lets me know that you want me to keep putting these out on podcast because I, I do gotta pay for the, uh, the software for hosting the podcast. So. People ain't leaving me reviews and ratings and, and whatnot. If I'm not getting ratings and reviews, then uh, I'll probably stop paying for the podcast service. So just let me know that you're enjoying it that way. So yeah, do me that favor. And uh, I just wanna talk about Patrick Mahomes for a second because I know he's a guy that a lot of you guys absolutely love, but his early season schedule is absolutely brutal. First game at Los Angeles Chargers. That's really hard. They have arguably this, the best secondary after this draft. The next game at Pittsburgh. Underrated, but a very good passing defense as well. Then they play at home against San Francisco. Like I said, nothing to be scared of, but definitely improved. Next game at Denver, then home against Jacksonville at New England. So four of the first six games are on the road. They have to play the Chargers, the Steelers, Denver, Jacksonville. New England's not necessarily crazy scary, but it's also on the road in Foxborough. Those are the first six games. So you might be excited about drafting Patrick Mahomes, but guys, it's going to be hard to start him in the early part of the season because of the schedules are so tough at that point. So sure, there's upside there, absolutely upside there, but I just want you to be smart, be realistic, and know that maybe if you draft Patrick Mahomes, maybe pair him. Look at his, you know, the weeks that he's had, that he has tough schedules and pair him with one of these three guys that has er, uh, easier schedules at the time. So that's the video for today. I hope you enjoyed Wednesday's video. I'll be back Friday with a mock draft. Leave a comment down below what kind of mock draft you wanna see, what platform, Yahoo, ESPN, uh, more best ball drafts, Fantasy football calculator, whatever it is, let me know the league scoring types, all that kind of whatnot. And uh, again, leave a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video, if you found it valuable, helpful. Subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I'll see y'all Friday.